<laughs> All right, let's get started. Uh, for those of you who didn't get the the, the survey, is fine. We'll uh, it'll be on the website later today, whenever the internet comes back, and then uh, I'll post this again on Wednesday. Okay, let's get started. So you're here for introduction to embedded systems. Today we're mostly mostly going to do a course overview and then getting you ready for your lab. So we're going to go talk through the basics of GPIO uh, and to get you ready for this week's lab. And I am uh, Lance and Sample. So uh, you may know or may not know, I, I post all the slides, a redacted version of the slides on the website the night before so that people who want to go through and follow along in the course are welcome to. Um, but I usually try and hide the answers. So uh, they're up there, except for now they're not up there, so good luck with that. Um, this is out of order, but I realize this is probably the most important slide uh, of the whole lecture. And it, is, it says here, always remember that it's impossible to speak in such a way that you cannot be misunderstood. There are always ways for someone to misunderstand you. So think about that. You've had times in your personal life when you're talking to your parents, your boyfriends, girlfriends, spouses, friends, there's been misunderstandings. Right? It's going to happen. You, the English language is very verbose. There's lots of ways to express it yourself, but it's not very exact. Lots of ways to misunderstand. So think of my job as a teacher here. I'm trying to communicate to about 70 different students and the likelihood that I will communicate, even though it's my job to communicate well, in such a way that it will be perfect for everybody to understand is probably impossible. I'm sure some of you are already figuring, thinking to yourselves, this can't be embedded systems class. It's a philosophy, or philosophy slide. You're right. You are confused. And so my plea to you is ask questions. The best way I can resolve questions and help you learning is to, if you answer, ask questions in class. So please do that. All right. So we'll get to the announcements. Uh, survey, yes. Uh, you guys have homework one is assigned. I will post a direct link to the Google uh, Doc uh, in Piazza if it's not already there. It's also in uh, GradeScope. It's basically uh, to help you get ready for uh, your GPO um, stuff that we're going to do in uh, lab. So uh, it will be due after Labor Day uh, this week. Uh, so our lab structures are such that you have a pre-lab, you have it stuff that you do in lab. And then you have a post lab. And so this week, because you guys are also starting out, your pre-labs will be due in, in lab this week. So you can, if you have time and are available, try and get them done early. But if you have questions or there's things you can't get quite done, uh, you can do your pre-labs uh, in lab. Um, the exam dates are, are correct, are set. They're on the website, which you can't see. Uh, we're still waiting on exact times and locations. But it's pretty much is going to be on uh, those days. Uh, let's see. And make sure everybody's enrolled in enrolled in Gradescope and Piazza. I try to get the latest list as of Saturday. Probably missed some people. Uh, we don't use Canvas because Canvas is lame. All right. Any basic questions so far? All right. So today we're going to talk about what is embedded systems. A little bit about the course. And then we're going to do some architecture on the STM32, which is the microcontroller you're going to be using in, in your labs. All right, so embedded systems. Let's think about embedded systems. They're everywhere, right? Embedded systems uh, are in, you know, there's about, a, on average, 130 microcontrollers or embedded systems processors of some type in a car all over uh, planes and trains all over the world, or all over the locations. There's embedded systems. You have them in medical devices, your home home electronics and office stuff, they're everywhere, and in your consumer electronics. So all these are c classes of computing devices that do not have a traditional keyboard and screen. That's what you guys are going to be learning about this semester. So here's an example. Here's a, uh, here's a Nest. So it's a thermostat, right? Let's look at what's inside of this thing. OK, so we got an LCD screen, uh, some rotary encoder for user inputs, and there's a touch screen as well. And look inside of this thing. It's kind of amazing. It's got a Cortex uh, A8, which is an application processor. This is an old processor that basically was in cell phones 10 years ago, right? That's in a thermostat. Then it's got something that you guys will be more used to, a Cortex uh, M3. So it's a small little microcontroller, not, not designed to be human facing. It's designed only to process information basically from sensors and communicate and that sort of stuff. It's got Wi Fi. Zigbee, Bluetooth, it's got external memory, two motion sensors, uh, but, uh, dedicated power management uh, IC, and USB. Even though you don't plug USB into anything, it's got it, just in case. 
It's got lithium charging uh, batteries and, and recharging circuitry. And it even, if you can believe it, it also has a temperature sensor and humidity sensor. Amazing technology Google's come up with. So maybe my question is to you, why is all this stuff in here? What is motivating these companies to put all this technology into a thing that all it really does is say, when you hit a certain temperature, uh, turn, on the, turn on the air conditioning or turn on your heating. Why is all this extra stuff in there? Internet of Things. What's that? Internet of Things. So, okay, so tell us, tell us more. <laughs> uh, the concept of like linking everything at home together, I guess, for automation purposes or yeah. convenience. Yeah. They're trying to, yep. We're progressively getting lazier. Progressive, yes, it's true. We get more options to us, we're getting a little bit lazier. So now I can talk to my phone over Alexa and have it turn on the thermometer for, or thermostat for me because I don't want to walk over. Okay. What else? What is, what is the Google's play here? What are they trying to do? Why do you need to have Wi Fi, Zigbee, and Bluetooth, and there's a flexible radio there, uh, and an application class processor? Why? Accessibility. Kind of. Google looks at this as this is the gateway into, their, into your home. You put this there, and now you're going to connect all the other Zigbee, all your other Wi-Fi devices can connect to this and go back to the Google ecosystem. Just like Alexa is thinking, all right, we're going to put that smart speaker, and we're going to connect everything through that. The tech companies are trying to find the gateway into your home so they can automate your life, and then you buy more products that are compatible with it. It's fine. Good to understand what their motivations are, right? Because again, all this does is just turn one line, like a 12 volt line, high or low. That's all it really does to turn the heat on and off. All right, so let's take a quick detour here and talk about how did we get to all this mess? Why is all this in here? Why is it possible now that can happen? Okay, so we look at the progression of time. This is log scale approximately. And we see that um, the number of computers per person has been growing. So it used to be that you'd have a mainframe. Right? And that would be one computer per institution. So all of University of Michigan would have one mainframe. And then they had this thing called the mini computer, which was maybe like the department would have one. Then you had a workstation, and then the personal computer, everyone at home could have one. So here's you know, one for work, and then you, or one per like office, and now you get one for every person. Then you have laptops and cell phones. So the number of... Um, uh, you know, I should have had this before, but the, uh, the number of devices per person keeps increasing, okay, as time goes forward. We can look at the size, the volume of this technology keeps decreasing, so from rooms to desktops to computers to laptops to phones, as a function of time, that starts decreasing. And the cost also dramatically decreases. This is why we can all have phones of, you know, either $1,000 phones or even $100 phones are all about the same uh, well, approximately the same functionality, but uh, it's all because the, the price is starting to come down for all this computation. So if we think about this, um, there's this Bell's Law which says roughly every decade a new lower price computing class forms based on new progression or program paradigms, networks, and interfaces resulting in a new, in, new class and in establishing in an industry, sorry. So basically they're saying is every 10, every decade, or so, we come up with a new class of computing device. What's driving this? Many of you have probably heard about Moore's Law. This is just a statement that says the amount of um, uh, processing power or transistor count doubles every 18 to 24 months, which has been roughly true, even as uh, this industry has changed, it's roughly true. And this is really a statement about economics, not computational power. But basically, you're saying as we go forward in time, things are going to get cheaper and cheaper to make computation. Go through, look at trends in wireless communication. Okay, so we have things like nomadic devices, like cell phones, laptops, things that aren't part of a uh, aren't part of wireless infrastructure like AT and T would have. But these are your consumer devices. We look at their speeds over time have increased. We look at wireless communication. Uh, like GSM, cell towers, those sorts of things, and you have wired. So it's also interesting just to see that they're converging. At some point, the speed you're going to get out of wireless is going to be the same you get from a wired connection, at least according to this plot. And so as engineers, you get to think to yourself, what's that world going to look like? What's the future going to be? Uh, this is also, uh, we have advances in battery technology, making our things mobile. So 
about every nine to 14 years, the density, energy density of our battery storage uh, doubles. So we can see as a function of time that we're getting more and more for the same volume, we're getting more and more uh, storage capability letting us have, right, about here or so, in this range, all of a sudden we started having a lot more mobile devices. Probably, unfortunately for me, many of you may have been born in this area, I was thinking how old I was, I am, but uh, all of a sudden we went from nickel hydrogen or nickel metal hydride to lithium polymer, and all of a sudden all these consumer electronic devices became mobile. And this is not similar to Denard scaling or Moore's law. This is more uh, the, chemi or the chemical engineering and material engineering folks making systematic breakthroughs. It just happens to have this trend. There's no inherent reason for it. All right, so what's driving Bell's law? So Moore's law, we talked about that, making transistors getting cheap. Denard scaling was uh, a lithography, a result of increasing uh, or decreasing the size of our transistors and our, and our um, chips, and it made things that for the same amount of power, things would get faster and, or so, uh, things, chips would get faster and lower voltage resulting in lower power. That was true up until about 10 years ago, but still that was driving a lot of innovation. Um, some cool results of this that are matter for us thinking about really small computers is that if you hold the transistor count small, uh, constant, uh, as a function of time, things become exponentially cheaper and ex exponentially lower in power. So if you don't think about servers, servers are always going at the highest, they don't care about power, they're trying to do the highest performance. But if we just said, all right, give me a server from 20 years ago, that amount of power, now you're getting something uh, that will be much, much lower, uh, or that much, sorry, 20, a server from 20 years that, and keep that amount of computation fixed, the amount of energy and cost it would take now to reproduce that server would be much, much smaller. Um, and then other technology innovations such as um, displays, LCDs, plasma, OLDs, uh, MEMS technologies, different types of memory have really transformed how um, uh, we can have mobile devices. Um, near threshold computing, so this is a special subclass of integrated circuit technology where you can have things that are s much slower but much, much, much lower power and new wireless standards. So all these things, you can think about these are the factors that are influencing technology that you will get to play with because you're going to choose radios, you're going to choose all these different peripherals to incorporate into your embedded systems and this will impact what it is that you can create in the future. Oh yeah, and battery technology. All right, so this is my question for you. This, now this is always a retrospective view here. It's hard to predict the future, but we're here in the 2020s. What is the next, what is the, the class of computing devices that is being created now, that in 10 years from now we'll look back and say, aha, that is the thing. That is what our, this period of time is known for. So I'll have you talk amongst yourself, but you might want to consider the size, you know, how many devices there are, uh, the cost, um, how users are interact with them, how they're controlled. So take 90 seconds or so, talk amongst yourself, come up with an answer, what's the, the next class of computing devices? Yeah, it'll take a lot of development. 
getting points for the There's nothing new about that. They're basically just not really like smart phones. Like, I mean, it's like it's accessible to everyone. Like, from laptop? I guess from from all laptops. I'm not saying it's just like an Apple Watch. It's like, obviously, it's like, yeah, it's like, 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 it's like
So maybe I'll ask you a question. Is a mobile phone an embedded system? I'm going to take 30 seconds to think about it. Talk to each other if you would like. There's so many different <laughs> All right, what do you think? Is a phone an embedded system? How about, how about everybody who thinks it is raise their hand? And everybody who doesn't, raise your hand. Some people are sleeping, that's totally fine. So, all right, give me a, give me a reason why it is an embedded system. iPhones are built for like app store games and things, like built around like a specific use. That's true, right? It's not trying to be every computing device, it's trying to be a particular computing device, it's trying to be a phone. I think like, the first phones were kind of more embedded systems because they only really had one purpose to yeah. call someone. Versus as they progress, they can do so many more things. Okay. All right. Uh, fine. I got. I'm with you. So what year? When did that happen? Two thousand three. Yeah, I'd say like with the iPhone, two thousand seven. Two thousand seven. Okay. Anybody else got another guess? Um. Yeah. Well, we were saying 2003, I feel like the BlackBerry kind of introduced a lot more, like, I think you could, like, email on it. It was very, like, business-based. It had a lot of features. Okay. 96. 96. Over here? Yep. So this is, a, this is not an embedded, this is an embedded system and that is not? Could be? All right, any other, any other guesses? I mean, this is debatable. There's no one pure answer. I'm not going to be right when I show you my next slide. <laughs> All right. I'm going to argue it's 2008. I argue it's 2008 because all these devices had were fixed function. The manufacturer made one thing. But they weren't general computing yet. Okay. And I'm going to say the innovation that changed phones, even this phone, into a general purpose computing device, was the App Store. All of a sudden, we can now write programs to do other things. It wasn't just the manufacturers. Uh, particular viewpoint. Uh, now, you know, you, you could get an app that did something else, or you could make your own. And so after that, I believe these, and they also became very powerful, right? You can do lots of different things on your phone. So all of a sudden, I think, in my view, 2008 is when phones crossed in from embedded systems to uh, general computing devices. What about autonomous vehicle? Is that an embedded system? Some of them. Some of them. How so? Like, if you're playing games in your Tesla, that's not a better <laughs> Okay. If you're, if you're driving, like, a Waymo car, that's probably a better system because it only purpose is driving safely. Okay. Anybody else? Any reason this is not an embedded system yet? I think, like, autonomous vehicles have series of embedded systems in them. Like, a lot of uh, the computing power is used for sensing and processing and things like that. But then there's also... Like you mentioned, Tesla has added so many different features, and they have specific systems. And like Tesla itself has whole departments that are dedicated to just doing that. So I feel like they have separate computing power and um, chips and things for that. Mm -hmm. Any other point? Viewpoints? Yeah. It's a conglomeration of embedded systems, but the vehicle as a whole, depending on how advanced it is, it can be something else. I think that's about right. I think that's where I would come and argue. I'd say that this device, this vehicle here, has embedded systems. So it has LiDAR and sensors and GPUs in it and all sorts of things in it. But really, that's a robot, right? That's, a, that's an advanced robot. It doesn't have an arm on it. But you know, that's a robot, but it uses embedded systems. All right, how about this? SD card. Is this an embedded system? You know I'm going to be tricky about it, so I can see the questions in your eyes. Yeah? I think it is an embedded system. Okay. It's so 
this is to just store memory. Wouldn't that be, wouldn't we say that's a memory storage device? I think there could be a difference between a memory storage device and an embedded system, purely from that, that statement. Any other viewpoints, yeah? Yeah, I think it's not because it's not actually doing computing. Okay. Like it's just a storage device, like you were saying. Okay, yeah. I think it is because it's like it's a layer of abstraction between whatever it's in and the like actual storage. Now what's, uh, yep, you're getting close. You're getting to some interesting ideas. Here, I'll give it away, at least the way I look at it. So um, you're, like a hard drive, I wouldn't consider it to be an embedded system. Memory module, DRAM's not an embedded system. But in this particular case, okay, uh, if we look at this hard drive, and maybe at general hard drives you can make that argument, but if you look at this as a, a view of SD card and it has a little microcontroller on it, you never see it. And actually, it's usually an 8051 or maybe an ARM7 or something, some little piece of compute. And the reason is that this storage medium is actually super lossy, right? And so no longer, even with big hard drives, are we just storing a one and then pulling one or zero and then pulling that out. It's a probabilistic approach, right? You, there's errors in this channel. There's errors in memory. And maybe you'll have some bits that don't get in there. So you have to add extra codecs in there and extra encoding to have some redundancy. And there's a whole subfield of signal processing uh, related to uh, error correction. And so what you find is that a lot of the SD cards actually have a microcontroller in there that's doing the error correction. When you write, word, when you write files onto it, it adds the error correction. And when it uh, reads the data out, it corrects any errors that were there and then presents you with a file. And so from the computer's point of view, it's just transparent. It doesn't have to worry about the, the capabilities of the, um, of the memory itself. All right. All right. So I think um, I'm going to ask you to come up with a, a, a definition of embedded systems for yourselves. We already see this hard. It's not. It's not easy all the time. Um, and so I'll have you guys break up into groups, talk about it. So things about things that are definitely are embedded systems, things that are borderline, and things that are clearly not embedded systems. And take some time to, to talk amongst yourselves. What are you saying, like the lack of purpose? And it's have it's used for a very specific purpose. So like so we have it has a sole purpose. But the system is falling. <laughs> 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 You can see, like, yeah, the Blackberry did so many things, and that's like what we were saying. It was, like, it was, like, it was designed for those functions that had every calculation. Like, your iPhone, iPad, whatever, like. Yeah, yes, but in itself is not a very system of sick program designed to do things that it wasn't originally I was just talking with the actor. I don't care about your plan that goes weird. I think you can argue the other one. I'm going to Takes input in the point that like when it's some, a single system. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So like a calculator in yeah. a system. So like a calculator in a system. So we've got a processor, and we've got our, yeah. our, yeah. our, yeah. our, our yeah. circling yeah. hardware. Our, I didn't know SD cards had this. Does it? No, no I like, didn't know. Yeah. 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 All right, does so anybody have a definition they like to share? Knowing full well that it's probably going to be imprecise, right? There's no correct answers here. Does anybody have a definition of an embedded system? It's some sort of computing device that is really good at doing a specific task and not necessarily designed to do anything beyond that. OK. Okay, so computing and purpose built. Okay, any other definitions or criteria? All right, let's see what textbooks say. 
Uh, a digital system that provides a service as part of a larger system? Mm, okay. Feels about right. I don't know about the larger system part, but okay. It certainly counts for the, the self-driving car. That makes sense. Any device that includes a programmable computer, but it itself is not a general purpose computer. Okay, that kind of gets to the specificity part where it's trying to be built for a particular purpose, but it has some compute. Kind of like this one, a less <laughs> visible computer. Huh? Feels about right. It's about as accurate as we've gotten so far here. So a something that doesn't look like a normal computer doesn't have a keyboard and mouse. Okay. A single function, tightly constrained, reactive computing system. Feels pretty good. Certainly is gonna be true for most of the, the projects that you guys build here. Yeah? What does reactive mean in that context? Uh, it's something that will probably measure the state of the world and then respond to it in some way. So uh, thermostat's an example. It measures temperature and then activates your cooling system. So another one, a computing system that is with a dedicated function within a larger mechanism or electrical system with often in real time computing constraints. Um, I think to get this larger mechanism, I guess it's an embedded system maybe with some actuators or something. Maybe that's what they're thinking. This idea of real time computing, that feels about right too. Oftentimes you're trying to do things that are fast compared to humans. Now the term real time often gets uh, overused. It used to mean things that had a definite, deterministic compute time no matter what. And now it just means faster than humans can perceive. That's usually what real time or quick enough for humans. OK. So again, you'll see that there's no perfect solution, although I like the less visible computer one. That works for me. All right, so some key takeaways. Um, technology and market forces are driving the evolution of the computers. So, the, the things that you are going to use as uh, parts and materials to create embedded systems are constantly changing. So when you get out into the world and are working at your startups or companies or whatever, it's important to see where technology is going so that you are ready, you are in position to take advantage of it. And then um, I think the other part, there's no precise definition of what embedded systems is, but I think you should be able to identify it when you see it. Now, the SD card is a hard one. If you open it up, you might be able to see it. But generally, I can tell you if it's an embedded system when you describe it to me. But it's hard to have a general overall uh, definition. All right, so now we're going to go on to what de uh, details of the course. Does anybody have any questions or comments? Yeah. Would you consider like a TI-84 an embedded system? You can like download like other applications onto it. Yeah, there's, a, there's something about the phone that has so much extra horsepower, right? So a TI-84 is, is a calculator, feels like embedded system to me because it's very general, very fixed purpose. Yes, it's true you can do some extra things to it, but it's not like a phone where I can play video games and do work emails. Like, I don't know, the, I don't know, I don't have a good definition, but I feel like it's an embedded system. <laughs> All right, any other questions? That's a good question. I should make a slide for that one. All right, let's go on to what, what the heck this course is about. Okay, so you've met a little bit about me. I'm an associate professor here. Uh, before this, I worked in 13 years in industry. So I worked at uh, places like uh, Intel Research, Intel Labs. Uh, I worked at Disney Research, ended up running a lab at Disney for, with about 50 people in it, and then came here. I work in the field of human-computer interaction, uh, which is, I work on the technical side of that. Usually it means I build systems that sense and understand humans and respond to them in some way. I use a lot of embedded systems. I use a lot of wireless tech in that. Um, our lab instructor is Matt Smith. Um, he's been uh, teaching for about 17 years this class, probably a couple years. I've, I haven't updated this slide in a while, so it might be 18 by now, I don't know. Um, I, he won't be in all your lab sections, but he is the, the guru to go ask to. He knows the tool change the most. He knows uh, he's been teaching SPI and all the different concepts that you'll learn about in this class for a long time. Uh, we also have uh, our instructors. So we have a GSI, Nathan, and then two uh, instructional aides, Brian and Raja. Um, so they'll be uh, in your labs uh, providing you with support uh, this week and you know, throughout the course. OK, so the goals of the course. Learn to implement embedded systems, including software and hardware-facing side. Learn to design embedded systems. 
how to think about embedded systems hardware and software. Um, and as many of you know, the big culmination of the course is design and build non-trivial embedded systems. So you'll have a large uh, project that lasts maybe a third of the class, maybe a little bit more. And then really it's, we're trying this course, we're trying to give you the founda foundational knowledge so that you will be able to learn embedded systems on your own. The best compliment I've ever gotten from this, uh, from a student 373 who says, don't, you don't have to t tell me anymore. He was working a hard problem. I don't know what they were forget what it was, we said, don't worry, you've taught me enough, I know how to read the data sheet now. Like, great, then, then my, essentially my job is done, because if you look at data sheets now, they're incomprehensible without some background, right? They're just, they're throwing terms around, it's, they assume, the people who wrote the data sheets assume that you worked at that company for 10 years, that's what their assumption is, right? So you can't understand embedded systems until you've worked on them for a long time, so we're gonna spend the semester teaching you, so now you go look at any microcontroller data sheet, and you're like, okay, I get what this is. I know what's going on. You'll be able to read that and use that microcontroller. Okay. All right, uh, prerequisites, as many of you know. So um, we a lot of the first part of the class is a lot of 370, but focused on our particular mark, our micro, microcontroller architecture. The part that is a little bit tough for some folks is it's good to know some basic circuits Right? Some people have said, oh, 215's a requirement. I don't actually want to test you on any circuit theory. I don't want you to know how to do circuits, but you have to know, have to know it well enough to get the job done. And the challenge here is that in 370, they taught you how a microcontroller or micro or computer core worked, but now we're going to have signals that go out into the world and start interacting with other things like servos and motors. And so you have to know, and LEDs, you have to know enough about how voltage and current work to get through that. So for those who haven't taken any circuits courses, um, come, come to office hours. I'll teach you everything you want to know about circuits. It's not going to be that much, and your first homework will help you start thinking about that world, at least enough for it that you need for this course. Any questions or concerns? Every once in a while, you get a computer science student here that's like freaking out because they're like talking about voltage and current. But don't worry, it's, we're not testing on that. You just need to know some of it to, to make the job of learning the rest easier. All right, so topics, mostly we're gonna be, of course, is all focused on the Cortex-M4, so this is an ARM processor. The, the numbers, the words don't matter, I'm gonna teach you all that later this week, but it is one of the most popular microcontroller architectures there is. Once you learn this, you can work in most companies. We're talking about instruction sets. We're gonna talk about this concept of memory mapped I.O., uh, which is basically how you use the peripherals of microcontrollers. Um, how you use switches and LEDs and keyboards and that sort of stuff. Talking about interrupts. So this is how you can stop, you can have external things stop your code execution and do other things uh, that are necessary. So they're asynchronous from your code. So instead of always checking to see if the, LED, if the button is pushed, you can have your controller interrupt you, interrupt program flow to do a specific, specific task when the button is pressed. Uh, we'll talk about common ways to interface with things off the microcontroller. So uh, serial and SPI buses and I2C buses, these are all ways to communicate with other chips off the device. And we'll also start dealing with analog stuff. So how can you sense and understand the world? We'll also talk about DACs, basically generating analog signals. So course logistics, um, a lot of the course is about reading manuals and searching and finding the answers. We're trying to give you the basic background but there are gonna be lots of examples where like, I don't know, you chose some weird part, right, for your project, and I'm like, I don't know anything about that part. I'm gonna help you, give you tools to understand what's wrong with the S and that particular bus structure, but again, you are gonna to have to find the answers. We're gonna give you the underlying framework. Uh, I do encourage people to uh, especially get this book. If you like books, you, that's how you've been learning for it, you want good written examples, this book is particularly good. I don't make it a requirement because it's really at, at like a sophomore level, um, but it has uh, good examples in it specifically for the microcontrollers that you'll be using. The other book is a good reference. You can find a copy online. All right. Um, grade distributions of the class. This is on the website, but you can't see it today. Generally, the, the median of the course is a B plus or so. All right, so in lecture, we're trying to give you perspective on the field, uh, foundation embedded systems. Um, 
And we'll go through some examples and, and give you uh, things to exercises in class. There is a class participation grade. Typically, I give out lecture worksheets and stuff like that. You can fill them, you know, fill them out as part of the participation grade. Uh, being on Piazza also helps. All those sorts of things uh, are a small portion of the class. Uh, you can look at the class schedule. Uh, this is a snapshot of all the things. Uh, this is from last semester, but snapshot of um, lecture content, when labs are due, when assignments are due, all those sorts of things. Um, although I would encourage you to use grade scope before <coughs> the actual deadlines. Sometimes there's errors here. Uh, homeworks. So there'll be approximately six homeworks. I've purposely made them smaller. It used to be like four or three homeworks, and they were just like giant mega homeworks, and they would kill you because you'd actually have like some other class or something else in your life. And uh, students didn't like that. So we decided, or I decided to break them up into small, smaller homework assignments. They're, they're pretty manageable on a week scale. Um, these are the dates of the exam. They're on Friday. They'll be after the rest of your classes. Um, yeah. The nice thing is there's two exams. Uh, they're fairly early or senior. Like, how can I have an exam in uh, September? But we get two exams, and then basically there's no final, right? So you can brain dump all that information you've learned and just focus on your projects. <laughs> I took classes too, OK? Um, lab content. Uh, this week is mostly focused on tools and getting GPIO to work at all. Um, and there's the rest of the, the classes. You can estimate about five to six hours. Some weeks are longer. Some weeks are shorter. Uh, we have a student presentation. So uh, about halfway through the semester, my lectures stop. Uh, you have your final exam or your, your midterm. And then you guys go and will research a particular topic in embedded systems related to your project, usually, and give a uh, presentation to the class. Um, and then I'm sure most people know, but there is a large open-ended final project uh, you will build embedded systems of your own design within the constraints of budgets and safety and all those other things. Um, it's a major focus of the class. I cannot emphasize enough, and I'll keep harping on you, you have, you'll have to start early. The, your, your happiness as a person is directly proportional to how <laughs> early you start. So starting like last two weeks of the semester is just going to be horrible. Okay? Um, I think this class, I don't know what the reputation is, but I think there's a significant time commitment to this class. Over the last two years, we specifically tried to reduce the complexity of the labs. We used to have this old, uh, I mean, it's a nice embedded system. It was basically an FPGA and a microcontroller fused together in the same piece of silicon. And you could like do all sorts of stuff, like make your own bus structures. And like it was great, except it was really, really hard to use. And so most of the frustration in the class was like the tool chain was unusable. and it kept you from learning things. So we went to a much simpler um, microcontroller, much more popular microcontroller. And so that re ended up reducing the amount of time you would spend on lab each week. Um, so that became sane. Uh, the, the projects uh, do take a lot more time per week, but you're probably not in class anymore. At that point, we've stopped classes, so you can just focus on your projects. So hopefully, it all evens out to not being a horrible load anymore. You guys will tell me at the end of the semester. Uh, let's see. So to get out of this course, so in my view, before 373, students basically learned engineering and computer engineering in the abstract. It was like, aha, if I had this mythical computer, then I would write code for it, and it would do something, uh, like 370 style. Um, but then you take this class, and then you're actually taking the knowledge and synthesizing it and solve some real world problem. And after this course, I think of this as, at least for a computer engineer, really stepping and being an engineer. Because now, after this course, you can point to any of those IoT objects and basically say, yeah, I can make that. I can make a smart speaker. Maybe the voice recognition part, I don't know, really know how to do. But all the rest of it, driving speakers, you know, all that sort of stuff, I know how to do. Or make a toaster or a microwave. Yeah, sure, you don't know how to shoot microwaves at food. But yet, all the other digital parts of that, you will be able to make. Okay. So I think of that as the transform that is part of this course. Um, so next, we'll talk about the STM32 architecture overview. Does anybody have questions about the course itself? Concerns? Yeah? The toaster and embedded system? There's no computing power. Uh, what did I say? Toaster? How about microwave? Okay. Microwave is embedded system. Pretty simple. 
if you, especially if you think the, the Gravitron is the thing that actually makes the microwaves. If you just buy that part off DigiKey, which is like an online supplier, then you can make a microwave pretty easy. Yeah. Um, after, after the midterm, there's no more classes? There'll still be classes, but it's not like, uh, it's not going to be a lecture. Like, I'll give, um, students will come and give presentations on certain embedded systems aspects. So it would be great for everybody to learn, especially if you end up using those things in your project. You'll get a primer on it. Um, and then the, the final, like, last couple of weeks, there literally is no classes. Yeah? I might have missed it, but how many labs are there? There are four sections. Uh, but lab, like individual labs? Yeah. Like, there's seven labs. Okay. Yep. Are our lab and project groups limited to the students in our lab section? Uh, lab, is, lab assignments are people in your section. Uh, projects can be anybody from anywhere. Really, anybody in the class. <laughs> that can be a cross section, yeah. And we'll have uh, some team formation events. I mean, obviously, I'll give you much more information about the projects, but it's usually a fun time to figure out, like, all the robot people go over there and figure out what you want to make and, and get uh, different uh, people together to explore and ideas that they want to build. Any other questions? All right. Let's actually talk about embedded systems then. All right, so we're going to give an overview. This is intended to be a high-level overview of the Cortex-M architecture, okay? Um, I want you to, we're going to focus on what component, components generally do and how they fit together, not how they work, okay? So don't freak out. We're going to go fast. We're going to talk about all the stuff that's going to be rapid fire, but I want you to take away the big picture part so that when you go to lab, you're like, oh, I see. I'm supposed to be talking about GPI over here, okay? So don't freak out. All right, so this is your lab kit. Um, it's a, I forgot what it is. It's S, STM, Nucleo, I don't forget the numbers, but it's a Nucleo dev kit. So this is the microcontroller that you'll be using. Microcontrollers come in all different size and form factors with different capabilities, okay? So that's the chip that's on there. And then you have this dev board, and you program it through that little backboard there. You plug USB in there, and it has a whole bunch of peripherals on there. And you can find data sheets to tell you what all these things do. But most importantly, you have header pins that allow you to can connect to uh, your microcontroller and hook it up to test software, or test equipment, have LEDs and all these other things on there. Okay. Inside the microcontroller is uh, this is the general simplified architecture. So from 370, you kind of learn this thing, the, the, the processor core. So in the core, you, we have some extra things. We have uh, the, interrupt, uh, the, the, the interrupt controller. Uh, we'll talk about that in a bit. There's some debugging. So basically, you can do JTAG scanning. That's an extra piece you haven't learned about yet. But you have the ALU structure and fat, fetch structure uh, instruction decoding. Uh, register banks, memory interfaces, uh, that's kind of all the same that you had from 370. Okay. This class is about all the things that are outside the core. So we have memory. There's different types of memory on your device. There's SRAM, which is supposed to be fast. There's flash, which is slower but permanent, right? If you power the device down, it'll still work. Uh, you have other modules that we're not going to talk that much about, but it's probably important just to be aware that they exist. There's a memory protection unit to make sure that you're getting data out of the right locations. You're not taking um, you know, data and putting it into codes or interpreting it as code, even though it's all a part of a unified memory. Uh, there's a very cool module on this thing called the uh, DMA, Direct Memory Access, which can act like a simplified microcontroller and move data around your device when you program it correctly. Unfortunately, Matt will not let me have a lab on that, even though I think it's super cool. Um, you'll see that there's a whole bunch of buses on these things. So actually, this is also part of the bus. Uh, this is like a, uh, so buses you can think about are the streets, and all the other blocks are destinations on your microcontroller. So these allow you to push data through uh, the architecture. Okay, so if you, uh, they're all 32-bit buses. And a bus is simply just a structure that allows you to pass data through. So um, here we have a, a, a block diagram of something that's sending, something that's receiving. And you can imagine it really is just a bunch of D flip-flops that hold some state. 
some clock goes and it transfers data over to the other side. That's really all it's doing. It's just these might be on separate parts of the chip. There may be multiple receivers on there, and then you have some control logic to say, okay, I want to send data to this module or that module. But a bus is just 32 parallel wires with D flip-flops on either end. All right, so what we established so far here is that we have um, we have our core, we have different places that can store data that we might want to interact with, and we have a structure to push data back and forth, right? We can send data to different locations. Uh, there are slightly different uh, paths. We have the advanced peripheral bus, and, oh wait, so we have the advanced peripheral bus and the high performance bus. Basically, we have buses that are very good at pushing lots of data quickly, and buses that are much more tolerant to slow things. And what you'll find out is that your peripherals are asynchronous and slow, and they keep on requiring input from things called users. Oof. And uh, so these things have to be, this bus structure is designed for the slow world, while uh, the advanced high-speed performance bus is uh, you know, designed to work with things like cameras and USB, things that are fast, as well as uh, GPIO. All right, and then uh, you'll learn maybe in week four or so that there's uh, a bridge that goes between the advanced uh, high performance bus and the, the peripheral bus. Uh, you have things that are peripherals. So um, these are things typically that talk with the outside world, like uh, uh, serial ports. Sometimes you even have op amps in there and ADCs and DACs. You also have things like timers, so ways to keep time on the device uh, count up to a certain time and then uh, have some event occur. So you have all these peripherals you'll get to use to control your microcontroller. Um, and then you have the advanced bus. Practically, you don't know the difference. As a programmer, the hardware is going to be obfuscated away from you. Right? You're just going to be writing a program that loads and stores data everywhere. But to understand what happened, it's important to understand the constraints of when you send something to the high performance bus versus the peripheral bus. Where does it go? What's the ramification? Why is one much faster or slower? What's the delay involved? You need to, to understand a microcontroller, you need to understand the architecture underneath. And finally, uh, we have some interrupts. So interrupts, uh, we'll talk you know, a couple lectures on them, but this is the way the external world will interrupt your code flow, right? And launch other code that you've written to do a certain task. So you want to respond to the temperature sensor went too high, and now you should do something. Well, you don't want to always wait and pull in your code and look to see if that temperature measurement has left. You'll have another piece of hardware which will look at that temperature sensor and interrupt you when that thing is, when that event has occurred. All right. I know that's fast. You, we're going high level here. Does anybody have any questions? What was the full name of the APB again? What's that? Uh, what was the full name of the APB? APB, Advanced Peripheral Bus. Oh, okay. Yeah, no worries. Sorry. No, that's fine. Any other questions? We, I promise I'm going to teach you all this again. OK? All right. Uh, so let's just look at an example. So say you, you're thinking from your 373 brain, and you're trying to do uh, basic load uh, instruction, OK? So assembly is going to come up with a load. You got to get that out of memory. You're going to fetch that data. You're going to decode it. And then you're going to compute it. And it says, uh, and you don't know the syntax yet, it's going to say, uh, take the value that's in register 1 is the memory location, and get whatever in that, is that memory location and put it into register R0, OK? So now we're going to do that. So basically, now we're going to get, this is happens to be in data. This is SRAM. That is the, the data that's going to be brought into the core. And now it's going to go through the bus structure. And now you have data that was loaded from that memory location, went through the bus structure, and is now in that register. If you want to do a store, all right, the next instruction could be a store. You go through, you'll fetch it, decode it and then do some operation on it. Okay, and that said, store the value that was in R0. 
So that hex value there and store it somewhere. And that value, the register was, uh, the location was uh, not defined yet, but it was in some other register. And basically it said, send it off to some peripheral over there. So now you've put this piece of data, this 32-bit word, over into uh, a peripheral space. And so if you wanted to go and uh, change the GPIO pins, you would say you would have to write ones and zeros into some register on the GPIO pins so that those things could go high and low. Any questions so far? All right. Um, this is what the real data sheet, sheet looks like. You should not understand that. Yeah, I can miss Spike all the time. Um, you should not understand what this is. But by the end of the class, you absolutely will understand, or by the end of this course, you'll understand what this is. So here we have, um, there's your core, right? We talked about that. You have your SRAM. You've got, come on, your memory protection modules, uh, your, your uh, DMA controller. Here's your advanced peripheral bus and your... Um, Low performance bus, or actually there's two advanced, advanced peripheral buses on there. <coughs> then they go to your bridge. And those are, they have two in this particular chip, they have two advanced peripheral bus, or advanced high performance buses and two advanced peripheral buses. And then uh, those things feed off all your peripherals. So here you have timers and ADCs and SPI and all these sorts of peripherals that you want to use. Um, as well as a bunch of other things, timers and watchdogs and even DAX, okay? So soon you will be able to, to look at any of these diagrams and understand generally the capabilities, the impact of, on your, uh, of your embedded system that you're choosing, right? All right. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about GPO. So it stands for General Purpose Input Output. And when I mean that, it means a, a pin, a wire, that will have voltage go high or low. This is what we're trying to, we're trying to interface with the outside world. We're trying to turn the LED on or off. So this is an example of a chip, okay? Your chip has these uh, bond points on them. So these are little uh, bond pads and they have these wire gold. So somebody's etched away at this chip here with sulfuric acid and now you see that these are the wire bond pads and these wire these pieces of gold wire go from these bond pads over to the pins internally. And now this is what's soldered onto this microcontroller dev kit. So this is onto the PCB. And so you can imagine how you'd have some peripheral here that's going to have some signal that goes high or low. And now the signal is going to make it onto that PCB. And then there's some trace on your PCB that's going to connect one of those GPIO pins to one of those uh, header pins over there. So now you can probe that with your oscilloscope or your logic analyzer. And the exact mapping is all in the data sheets. You can read through and figure out which pin is associated with which uh, um, header pin over there, which one of these pins goes to those header pins. And you have to figure out which GPIO number from the data sheet corresponds to which header pin. So this is just a way to show that, indeed, you control something on a piece of silicon and it affects the external world. Okay. Um, so this is uh, where the GPIO lives. It, on other architectures, GPIO will be on a peripheral bus, but in this particular one, microcontroller, uh, they wanted it to be accessed very, very quickly, so they went with a high-performance bus. As a programmer, you're you're not aware of those differences except when you have to think about latency. Why does it take so many cycles to get data from a, from a certain peripheral? Well, uh, it might be on the, the peripheral bus versus the high performance bus and that encodes, incurs some latency. All right, so now the trick is we have to figure out how to go from a register bank, right? And when you say, uh, you have some value in a register bank and you want certain pins to be high or low, it's gonna to have to go through the bus structure into uh, that GPO register. So what is a register? So remember, a register is just a group of D flip flops. This is just state holding devices. You put some one or zero here, you advance the clock one positive edge, and then that state is held over here. So this is just a place that's state holding information. So if you want to put a one out on a GPO pin, you put a one into here and it'll be fed out there. Uh, let's see. Typically, 
Um, most registers are 32 bits, although when you, you know, a couple weeks you'll be looking deep into the data sheet and you'll find out that even though you can write 32 bits in there, there may be less uh, actual registers. And they'll, they'll, those will be non-connected or no, no application, they'll say NA on them. But you can just think of all these registers as part of a 32-bit uh, bus where you're sending data in and then you can pull data out. Um, and so example here, if you wanted to store some data in there, you're literally going to, from your core, you're going to store data into this register, and then if you want to take data out, you're going to load it out. Okay. So this is just a, an approximation. You can think about, and you should think about, as a memory location, even though it's not part of SRAM necessarily, it's not part of Flash, it is a register somewhere else on your chip. Okay, you'll need to know the address of your GPO pin. Where do you get that? Evil professor says, See the data sheet, okay? And in lab, they're gonna tell you exactly what addresses you're supposed to be pushing data to. And then later on, you'll be looking it up on your own. Okay. All right, so let's think about the anatomy of a GPO pen for a second. So that means this is just one pen in isolation, it's a cartoon, so basically you have a D flip-flop. If you put a one in there, the GPO pen goes high, right? If you put a zero in there, the GPO is low. And that would come from the advanced peripheral bus. If you have an input, the input pin is just the opposite. The input pin uh, is going to put a one or a zero in. Oh, let's see if I advance this. Got to flip those around. Okay, I flipped them from the last time. So a data comes in, and then every clock cycle is going to be held on there. Okay, and then it's the job. If you want to know if that pin is high or low, your core has to go in here and read the data out and put it in a register, and then you can do some operation on it. This register is not in your core. This register is off in the peripheral space connected right to that GPO pin. All right, and we can put those things together. So inside uh, any general purpose I.O. port, you have an input register, an output register. You have some control logic we'll talk about in a second that decides, that helps you decide if this should be an input or an output. You have to tell it, right? You can't be putting a one out and holding a LED high or a pin high and then also have something else talk at the same time. You have a conflict. So the pin can only be driven or uh, it can either be an output or an input. It can't be both at the same time. And again, this is just ones and zeros. We're not talking about serial communication yet or anything. It's just only two states that pin can be. And so these are essentially connected. Uh, let's see. And so you have some control logic, and this logic is going to control this output stage, and it's going to either say, okay, I want you to be an input or an output. And if it's an input, data is going to go up to that input register. If it's an output, you're going to take data from here, and it's going to be pushed out here. And then you have another register that controls this GPO pin to say either input or output, or high impedance don't do anything. And sometimes, uh, you'll find out they have alternate functions. Sometimes a pin can be an ADC pin or a UART pin or a serial communication pin. But for right now, we'll just think about it. It's going to be either an input or an output. What questions do you guys have so far? Oh, too many circuit diagrams. I know. I feel questions. Yeah. What's this plus there for? Just to keep it so it's only one or the other? This? Yeah. Uh, this is, um, I was about, just about to get to that, good question. This is here as an output driver, right? So if you're going to drive a signal out in the real world, uh, you know, you have little transistors in here. They don't have a lot of drive power. They can't push a lot of current or push a lot or pull a lot of current. So you usually have an output stage. It's called a push-pull output stage. I'll show you that in just a second. That's the, that's the goal is just to be able to, you know, if you have an LED, you don't want to put nanoamps into it. You need milliamps into it. But all the logic internal on your device is more in the nanoamp range. Yeah? So how is the uh, GPIO um, connected into the... Great question. And, I, and again, I went fast, so I understand how that could be confusing. So generally, it's all connected to this high or advanced high-performance bus. Everything that was done on a microcontroller has got to be advanced. There's nothing to this, there's nothing that's simple. So it's advanced high performance bus. And if we go all the way back here, this is this bus structure through here. 
and this would be 32 bits wide. You may only be using one bit to, con you will be only using one of those 32 bits to control any particular GPIO pin. But you're going to have to write a 32-bit word here. You may only update one pin with that data. Okay, so, you, so basically, you're going to do a store. You're going to store a word into that register we just saw. And you're only going to use one of the bits to control any one LED or any one pin. Does that answer your question? What more questions do you have? Um, well, I guess, like, in my head, I'm seeing the peripheral being connected with a wire into the actual process. Yep, it is. That, that register is part of, uh, where did it go? Uh, uh, I forgot where it was. It was part of a bus structure. So there's 32-bit wires in parallel. Maybe it was way up here. Let's see. Here we go. So this is that wire. So this is your peripheral GPIO. This, this little one could be the output register that we just talked about. There is a wire that comes all the way over here. But we're going to have a bunch of logic in between that we're going to learn about so that we can send the data to different memory locations or different register locations. So that's why the bus is special, because things on a bus have an address. So one of those addresses will be GPIO pin, you know, GPIO port A pin 0. And then you can say, OK, I'm going to put a 1 from the, reg from the core into that thing, and that will hold the state, which should be represented on the output pin. Yep. So each bus structure has two registers with the other side? Uh, like a sender and a receiver? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. In fact, uh, you'll find that most bus structures have one sender and multiple receivers. Uh, and those, each one of those receivers has an address associated with it. So you're saying, OK, uh, this timer module has address such and such, and I want to send data there. Or this other place has a different address. Okay? And we're just talking about the GPIO pin. So we don't, we'll talk a lot about addresses in bus structures, but that's, you've, got the, you've got the general idea. So sorry, the, the pin you were talking about, is it like a 32 register, 32 pin register, or just like one of the registers? The what I was talking about? Uh, the pin. The pin, the pin um, is one register of a 32-bit, uh, sorry, is one register, here, let's go over here. And, and, uh, these are great questions. So this is one pin. An example, and it probably has th at least three registers to control one pin. And you have an output register, which, I, is, which is concatenated with a bunch of other registers. So you're going to put a 32-bit word into some memory location. One of those 32-bit uh, bits is going to be assigned to any particular register, so say this register. And now if you put a zero in there, then it will have a zero on that one, or a low voltage, so zero voltage. And then if you put a 1 in here, it'll go through these push-pull pair, and you'll have high voltage, whatever the VDD is, so say 3.3 volts. And so this thing can go from between 3.3 and 0 volts. Okay. Well, these are great questions. What other questions do you guys have? Again, I know I can't speak clearly enough to everybody. We talked about that. So if you guys have questions, let me know. All right. Well, I'm going to confuse you some more then. Here we go. All right. Uh, we talked about this push-pull pair. Um, you can think about this is the structure which is going to provide current to the output. So I want to talk about that for a second. This is, again, review of circuits classes. You don't have to have taken a circuits class. Uh, we're just trying to get you to understand how it is that circuits can be pushed out. So I use Falstad a lot. I try to use it for logic. Falstad's great because it runs in a browser, and I can send you or you can, uh, you know, uh, you can share the URL, which encodes the entire schematic. So here we can run this thing. And here's just the, the primer of transistors. This is all you need to know about transistors. Transistors are switches. Don't, don't let those analog people fool you. They lie. They're not variable anything. They're switches. Okay? And uh, is this example, here's just an example of ability to change this output pin, which is over here. I think it's going to highlight in blue down there, yes. And I can change the state of this output pin just by changing this, trans this switch. So I'm going to close the switch that defines, I can't quite get up there, but this node right here must be 0 volts. And by opening and closing that switch, you can see on the bottom here, now I can make a pin go between 0 and 3.3 volts. Okay? And that is just the same as if I went over here with this transistor. I can now control that transistor. Actually, it's over in this place here. 
By controlling the input to that transistor, I can turn that into a switch. So transistors are just switches in this class. And if we go to our push-pull pair, which we decide, I can, if I control the top one, I can raise it up, okay? If I control the bottom one, I can lower it. And there's a little bit of a transition thing in here, just because it's hard to make perfect circuits. So here's an example of a push-pull pair. And you can see the bottom there is pushing things up and down. So I'm switching between, uh, you know, 3.3 and zero volts. And so when you see this, all you have to know is that this thing can push lots of current out. It's called a push-pull pair because you're going to push current out of it or pull current in. You can see the little yellow dots going in. Here it's pulling this node down to zero. And you can push current out from the microcontroller by going high. Now you're going from the VDD of the microcontroller and you're pushing current out and you're driving these relatively large loads of 100, kilo, 100 uh, kilo ohms. Okay. Yes? And the current always wants to drive towards the ground, right? Yep. Yep. Oh, you got to be loud. You're way back there. How is the circuit in the bottom right different from the one in the top left? Because this one and that one, that one can't, uh, that one is an older style of technology. We're using a resistor to pull back up high. The problem with that is you're always losing current in that resistor, so it's more power consumed, it consumes more power. So this would be an NMOS logic, which was popular like in the 70s, and then they're like, oh my gosh, power sucks. These things, you know, can't run them off a battery. And so they invented CMOS, so which is complementary logic, which have PMOS and NMOS basically switches. Not, not resistors, not those transistors, they're switches. All right, what other questions do you guys have? All right, I promise I'm almost done. I'm almost out of time anyways. Let's see what we got. Um, so these uh, circuits are in the slides. So if you get real excited and you want to, you can copy these circuits out. All right, you, you don't have to remember that. That's just the, that's just the <laughs> net list. All right, you copy this thing. You can try it out in your own browser, OK? Um, let's look at how an LED would work. So this is your lab, OK? Your lab is you press buttons and LEDs turn on. So let's think about what's actually happening underneath. So we have um, this whole thing represents a microcontroller, this wire would be the whole core and everything else. We're just going to make it super simple and just say that the inputs directly feed to the output, OK? So input of one pin goes to the output of another pin. We could certainly write a program that says load the value in uh, this register that's not shown, the D flip flop that would be there. Load that value into the core and then store it directly next cycle into the register that represents the output of GPO pin 2. Uh, maybe I should just add in the registers in these things, but I didn't. And so all that's happening here is you're going to press a button, okay? And that button is going to so normally the, the voltage here is being pulled down to zero. So normally this is zero volts. And when I push this high, or let's that switch, you can see the, the pin goes high. Oh, oh no, I broke my, I broke my circuit. These are real circuits here. Um, so... Here I push that button and you can see that GPL pin is goes high versus low. And then we just have a wire that loops back to our push-pull pair. And then when I push this button, uh, this line is going to go uh, push this line high. We're going to connect this switch here is going to connect to 5 volts. And now the LED goes on. And Falstad, which is the, I, I only know who Falstad is, the guy who made this app. Uh, basically, for LEDs, this LEDs are diodes, and he just makes the symbol when you're not hovering over it, look like an LED. And so here you can see that the LED is on when current's going through it and uh, off when no current's going through it. Okay? So essentially, that's what you're going to be doing in your lab, except uh, you're going to have a, uh, registers and you're going to be going through and pulling out the data out of that register and then loading that data into another register which has your LED connected to it. Any other questions? I promise we don't do any more circuits than this. Like, there are a few more circuits. So this is the level of circuits you need to understand for this class. Okay. All right, you want to see one, one more example of when embedded systems gets weird? Weird embedded systems? OK. Let's see what we got. Oh, I suppose we had takeaways. All right, fine. I'll do a real lecture. Hold on. 
I'll talk about weird embedded systems. Um, if you need a circuits review, you, again, these lectures are online. These are general YouTube videos, which is like eating dinner, watching YouTube videos if you want a refresher on, on circuits. Again, don't struggle with circuits. Come ask us about circuits. You just need enough to know that things go high, there's current involved, things go low, right? That, this is the level of things you need to know. There will be some basics about capacitors later on because they really affect how buses work. You don't have to be an expert at capacitors. You don't have to calculate anything, but you might want to review that. All right, so to recap, technology, driving forces, great students uh, should be able to identify an embedded system when they see it. Talked about course overview, high-level architecture. You need to know, basically, you need to push-pull um, LEDs and switches for lab. All right, in the next lecture, we'll talk about um, the ARM Cortex-M instruction set. We had a very simplified instruction set for 370. This is much more rich. We're going to look at a subset of it so you can understand the processor. We're talk about assembly and the application binary interface. <laughs> All right. <laughs> This class is going to be What's important is networking. Hey, you. And I'll show you weird, weird circuits next time. Weird embedded systems. Uh, yes. You said over there. How are things? Why are you taking this class now? So far, I feel like it's going to be a drive, but if this class is not here, maybe I'll stay away. Yeah. What campus do you stay on? Oh, me too. Oh, me too. Oh, me too. Like me too. Oh, 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 me it's a trans resistor. Yeah, it's a trans resistor, isn't it? Right, because you can, both you can vary the I'm being resistance. Oh, okay. Sorry. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I was just wondering, I can't look on the course guide right now to see what the different labs are, um, but I was wondering, I know that there's two Thursday, one Wednesday, and I thought there was two Tuesday. Or two Tuesday. Okay. Three to six, and then 6.30 to nine, okay. I think, and then Wednesday, three to six, and then Thursday in the morning, I thought. Thursday in the morning, okay. Can we move around lab sections, or just go to the, our assigned one? You should go to your assigned one. It's, it's hard because uh, there just won't be enough IA support okay. uh, if, you, if we all load it up in one. Okay, got it. Thank yep. you. About the Wikipedia definition for embedded systems, mm -hmm. where it said it was like specific devices that are used to build up a much larger computer. Yep. But in a sense, doesn't that mean like every single system here is an embedded system? Because as you go down and down in the levels, you get more specific. Every becomes an embedded system, right? Like a new word. Um, register. I mean, everything becomes hardware. You say that's, that. That's true. Um, uh, I think for a normal processor to be an embedded system because it is general purpose. It's not hasn't specified for any task yet. So maybe that's part of it. It has to be built for a specific task rather than built for general purpose tasks. Okay. That a, <clears throat> would you say that an analog watch like this one, this is not battery card, this is spring operated? Well, it doesn't have compute. So I think we can say there's some compute, right, it has to be specific for a task. Right, okay. But then what about like a digital one, like an actual battery operated digital yeah. watch? Uh, that's a better system. Okay. The compute's pretty simple. Um, I guess, I guess when, when does he transition from um, like a 5.5 five timer? Or something like that, that, yeah, that you yeah. could use to make a digital watch. Where it's just, when you transition from logic to embedded systems, is probably when you're running code on it. Okay. But there, yeah, is, I don't know if there's a perfect definition. So. Thank you. For okay. That. Yep. Hi, um, I'm Vishal. Um, I want to come talk to you. I'm super torn about kind of course selection this this semester. So I talked to some of my past professors. Okay. Um, I really liked the signals part of 216. So I was okay. at 351 right before this. 
Um, three fifty one is power, isn't it? Is uh, signal processing. Oh, signal processing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so I was kind of torn between taking this and taking that, yeah. and four sixty one also, which I think kind of gives some embedded flavor. Okay. Um, do you have kind of any advice there as a CE? What is like the what do you think is more fundamental to to our program? What like, do you want to do when you graduate? Um, I don't know. I think it would be. Do you think that? How do you think the level of exposure 461 gives compared to this class? I guess it's my What's 461 is embedded uh, control systems. Um, yeah. I mean, it's very control heavy. So you're like, ah, I don't care about how microcontrollers really work okay. underneath. So and uh, here, you write some code, and then when you write this code, uh, this thing over here wiggles. Like this GPIO pin goes up okay. and down. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you can, so you will know how to use that embedded system, and you will have probably enough experience to try other embedded systems, but I think you'll always be held back a little bit because, yeah. like, uh, to, to go to the next step, you need somebody just to kind of show you the ropes of like, here's how microcontrollers work. Okay. And then once you see that, you're like, oh, I can use that 